Let me start with a very brief table of, con table of contents so you know where the journey is going, because in the beginning it can be a little rough to see where we want to go. So my talk has three parts. The first one is where I want to introduce the matching procedure and only the matching procedure of DMET. I will not give a total introduction to every individual step. I will just talk about this one part. And the path that I want to go is I want to start from a very high level description and then work my way down to a very low level perspective on what is actually going on in the computer. Um, I will take the route that is somewhat historic. So I will start with the least squares perspective and then introduce the matching philosophy that has been used up to this point. And while introducing this matching philosophy, I also want to introduce what, it's, what it actually means for a density matrix to be non-interacting, pure state, V representable. And having this concept introduced, I will question the current matching philosophy and suggest an alternative. Um, the numerical incorporation of this alternative matching idea is what we call the ALM DMET. So it is an incorporation of an alternative matching of the high level density matrix into the SEF DMET procedure. So after all this theory talk, I want to move on to the numerical applications. And there I have three very, very simple um, model problems or toy models that we are investigating. And as simple as they are, all these models actually show something that is um, very concerning in the DMET procedure, which is the gapless problem. And then after going through the numerical applications, I will go uh, on and talk about further unanswered questions that came up during this numerical um, testing of the ALM DMET. Okay, so uh, DMET, we've heard a number of wonderful talks on embedding theory in general, and we've also heard two very nice talks by Lynn on DMET specifically, one in the tutorial week and one in the uh, workshop one. Again, in my talk, I will only focus on the matching part, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I want to give you a very rough bird's eye perspective on how DMET works. So the highest level idea of DMET is that you consider not the full system, but you partition your full system into small fragment systems. And each of these fragment systems interacts with the environment uh, and is interpreted as an open quantum system. So what you do is for each fragment, you define a bath orbital. And this bath, these bath orbitals, they model the interaction of the fragment orbitals with your environment. Now, so the bath or Hartree Fock. It is. It is. It is. No, no, it is Hartree Fock. Hartree Fock here. I'm sorry. I will I will get into details of this plot after the very, very bird's eye perspective. No, so this is the global system. Up here is the global system. But I will, I will get to this in a second. Yeah. Just the, the, the very bird's eye perspective is that if you had access to the exact bath orbitals, you would model the interaction between fragment and the environment correctly. However, to construct the exact bath orbitals, you need the exact wave function of the system, to which we, of course, do not have access. Otherwise, uh, we wouldn't be here, right? So what DMET does, it tries to improve the bath in a self-consistent manner. So what, how does this work? We have a hartree fock calculation at the global level, and we obtain a density matrix from this. And when I say density matrix, I mean the one RDM, the one particle reduced density matrix. And this one RDM, we put into this black box that we call the bath construction. So the bath construction yields based on this one RDM, the bath orbitals to each individual fragment. And fragment plus bath, as has been pointed out before, defines our impurity problem for each fragment. And these impurity problems we can then solve with a high-level solver. This can be full CI, DMRG, couple cluster single doubles, whatever your preferred high-level solver is. What you get out of this is a high-level solution, and you can compute so-called high-level density matrices. These are local quantities. They are smaller. They are 2L. 2LA by 2LA, where LA is the size of your fragment. Now what you do is, as been pointed out before, you don't trust the full 
local high-level density matrices, you only trust a certain block, the first LA by LA block. And you use these blocks to patch together a high-level global density matrix. Now, this does not arise from a mean field theory. So what we want to do in order to improve our bath, yeah, so this is sort of the feedback that has been pointed out um, in previous embedding talks, what we have to do is we have to find a match. We have to match this high-level density matrix as good as we can at the level of some mean field theory. And how this was done previously was, was with uh, the help of a correlation potential. And what we do now, we directly fit this, as I will explain in a little bit. And then once we have this fitted low-level object, we feed it back into the bath construction, which provides us with an updated and more sophisticated bath for each fragment. And we do this self-consistently until convergence is reached. So this is a very, very high-level description of the MEP, and there's many caveats and many knobs you can turn. And each of these turns, each of these knobs, defines your individual flavor of DMET. But we want to talk about the matching. Okay? And I want to pick you up where, um, where, um, from, from, from Lin's talk. So Lin also talked about the matching condition. So what is it that we want from our low-level density? So the low-level density, I will explain as I go how this thing is actually computed. But from this object, we want that it minimizes a certain energy functional. This can be picked at your flavor, your own um, favorite. And what we want is that it matches the high-level density matrix blocks. So the high-level density matrix blocks from now on throughout this talk are called Px. And the dx, that corresponds to the respective block in your low-level density matrix. So is D, sorry, Fabian, is D the density or the density matrix? The one RDM. Whenever I say density yeah, and density the matrix, density this is, there, so yeah? So this is all, matrix. they are all interchangeable in my okay, talk. Yeah. I will only talk about the one RDM. Very good. Um, so how, you, you can think of this projection, if you order your orbitals consecutively with respect to the fragmentation, this only means you pick out the diagonal blocks. So it's very useful in DMET to just think about matching diagonal blocks of some high-level object. <clears throat> now, there has been talk about the correlation potential, and the correlation potential is a very important quantity when talking about the historical way of fitting the density matrix. Uh, if you don't know how this is constructed, the way to think about it is that if you hear the word matching, just think about Lagrange multipliers that ensure this matching condition, and you patch them together in a block diagonal way, and this is your correlation potential. Now, it's, it only ensures that your density matrices are matched. <clears throat> okay, so how do you compute this low-level density matrix? What is the idea? You pick a one-body operator, here denoted T, and this can be, in principle, any one-body Fock matrix. Yeah, you can pick um, the kinetic energy only. You can pick the global Fock matrix. This is, again, up to your, your, um, your favor, to, to, to your favorite, and defines an individual uh, DMET flavor. Um, and then you add this U, and you diagonalize this low-level Hamiltonian. T plus U is what we call the low-level Hamiltonian. Yeah? And then you construct your 1RDM following the Aufbau principle. So I highlight I highlight the Aufbau principle here because later on this will be the condition that we relax. Yeah, so keep this in the back of your mind. The Aufbau principle in this picture of correlation potential fitting is always fulfilled. Now, what I just said in words can be compressed into this calligraphic D, which is a function that takes T plus U and the number of electrons. It diagnoses a low-level Hamiltonian, constructs a low-level density, and spits it out. This is basically what this calligraphic D does. Okay, oops, that was too fast. Um, let's go one level lower. So how do we, how do we achieve density matrix um, matching? So historically, this was um, done by using a least squares approach. Yeah, so this is the paper where DMET was actually introduced in 2012. And here the idea is really just to minimize this least squares problem. Um, <clears throat> so remember that D sort of consists consist of... I lost Fabian. What is the Px again? Px are the high-level density matrix blocks. So these were the ones you computed with your high-level solvers. 
and these are the ones you want to match. From now and for, for the entirety of this talk, px is this. And remember that d consisted of solving this eigenvalue problem and constructing your low-level density. So this is a, a, a nonlinear function. Yeah? So minimizing this least squares is in itself a nonlinear optimization problem with many local minima. And unfortunately, if you do this, you get stuck many times. It's very normal to get stuck somewhere. And even worse, two years after the introduction of the MIT in 2012, uh, Scuseria and coworkers 2014 showed that an exact match of this type of procedure is actually for some systems impossible. Okay, another thing that I want to focus more on uh, subsequently is a problem that crystallized over the past five years or so. And that is that your low-level Hamiltonian actually becomes gapless. So this causes a lot of problems in the optimization. I mean, the first thing that you note is that the construction of D in itself is ill-posed if these two states are, are degenerate, because you have a number of orbitals to pick from to construct your density matrix. Let's look into this in a little more detail. So the gapless problem means that your low-level system at some point becomes gapless. So the HOMO and LUMO are energetically the same. At this current state, we believe this is a purely numerical artifact, which means that before there was the discussion whether or not we can give like a physical intuition to a vanishing low-level gap. And currently, based on some numerical evidence that I will show later on, we believe this is not true. It's purely numerical and has to be treated as such. Sorry, you mean yes. for the systems you are considering? Because in general, it could happen. It could happen, yes. But you cannot say that in general there is a physical meaning behind the low-level gap. This is what we're questioning. I mean, anything could happen, right? So, but we, want like a, a, we, we don't see that there's a systematic connection between a vanishing low-level gap and a specific physical phase of our system. I will, I will explain what we did, and then we could, I, I would be happy to, to discuss. Maybe there is more to it. <clears throat> oh, yes? You don't have this kind of, you work in a restricted frame. You don't have in a fully unrestricted frame that will produce a gap anyhow. I don't have the unrestricted case or, that would be. Or, you are not working a fully unrestricted frame that the party fork level will produce a gap, right? I'm not sure if I follow your, um, your, uh, your question. As far as I remember, hard mm -hmm. to fuck. If you totally unrestrict it, give up all symmetry. Mm -hmm. As far as I remember, there was no gap mm -hmm. of all symmetry. Yeah. So. The gapless problem is not even posed. So you're basically saying that using GHF would totally entirely device. remove the gapless problem. Am I correct? Sir? But it's no longer hard to fuck, is it? It's not hard to fork. It's like T plus some U. So U is to be optimized. But the objective was hard to fork there. The objective was hard to fork. I haven't uh, specified the objective yet. I'm just about to do that. Um, may, may, what, what slide are you referring okay. to? I'm just, so, yes, so, continue. So, I haven't. Uh, I think it's the first so initialization. Oh, yeah, and the initialization, I mean, yeah. We use hard to fork because we have to start with, with, with something, but um, yeah. The, um, the actual t plus u that we are considering here, that's not um, hard to fork. So you have the t, the u, u is, okay. So let me talk about point two. Um, if these two levels of energy are degenerate, then we have some complications in the construction of the density matrix. And of course, what you can do is you can open your quantum chemistry toolbox and apply all kinds of different quantum chemistry tricks to, to resolve this. So you can try to get away with introducing some level shift, or you could do some finite temperature smearing and then pick, pick the right orbitals based on your chemical intuition or whatnot. You could also try to modify your cost function, but all these, all these things are more or less just patches for systems where you cannot solve the, the, the problem in its, um, in, its, uh, in, its, in its rigorous way. And this has the problem that it impedes the reproducibility of your results because different people have different opinions on which chemical tricks are applicable to which chemical system. So you will venture into discussions on whether or not this was fair or not. So we really uh, 
want to have a clean picture of how we can circumvent the gapless problem. This is what we were trying to do. And unfortunately, the gapless problem appears much more frequently than we would like. So I will show three very, very simple systems, and all of them show the gapless problem. So it's really a problem that is supposed to be taken seriously and has to be resolved if we want to push the MET uh, further. OK. So let me try to, to summarize the matching philosophy that was followed up to this point. So the problem is the following. You have a given t that you pick. This can be single, the, uh, yeah, whatever single particle operator you, you actually want. You have a computed high-level density matrices, Px, that come from your high-level solvers. And what you want to do, or what you wanted to do up to this point, is you want to find uh, Lagrange multipliers such that the density matrix blocks of your low-level density match the blocks of the high-level density. And you want this to be true for all, um, for all impurities, for all fragments. What is the ansatz? The ansatz is define an auxiliary low-level system, T plus U, diagonalize it, and construct the 1RDM. Okay? And again, the construction of this 1RDM uh, follows the Aufbau principle. And the question that we posed is, is this reasonable? So for me, like the wave function guy, this question didn't pop up. But if you are someone who is aware of uh, DFT, you know that you would see the resemblance of this to something that is called non-interacting pure state V representability of the density matrix. And if you are more aware of the DFT community, then you know that there, this is more of an exception than the norm. So it, it, it's not, it doesn't seem to pop up that often. But for DMET, it seems to be the norm rather than the exception. Polarizing statement, but we can, we can discuss. Um, also, if you, if you really are a, a DFT guy and know what you're talking about, you would see that this is not really exactly the same. It's a, it's a DMET variant of the non-interacting pure state V representability. But uh, let's not split fine hairs here. OK. Um, so what is the alternative matching that we suggest? We say, let's take one step back. And following this, this path of non-interacting pure state V representability, we drop the condition that we follow the Aufbau principle when generating our 1RDM. So we allow any kind of occupation profile in order to generate our 1RDM. So how does this read? We can write this out as a constraint optimization problem. So we have given, given high-level density matrix blocks, Px, and we define our energy functional, which is to be minimized. This is our choice. This is the one we pick. This is the one we like. So this is a trace of f times d, where f is now fixed to be the global Fock matrix. Now, this is a particular choice that we make at this point. And the constraints are that D comes out of the set M, where M is the set of emission matrices that have the correct trace and that are idempotent. Now, so we ensure that we have, um, this way we capture all different uh, occupation profiles, but we do not impose uh, that the density matrix follows from the Aufbau principle. And, of course, we have to impose the matching condition, that dx equal px for all x. But, but, but sorry, doesn't, yes. doesn't d square equals d and force all eigenvalues to be equal to 1? Or 0? Yeah. Or 0, yes. Yeah. So you can't have arbitrary profiles. Well, yes, why not? D okay, square I don't understand one. what you mean by profile. So, okay, so, so by profile... I mean, for me, I mean, a profile is... Uh, is uh, 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.63, 0 0.5, yeah. whatever. Oh no, let's let's look at it this way. Okay, so I just say so just say you have your one RDM, which you define. So this you will see later. I have like a sum of m, and here are my uh, single particle orbitals. Yeah, and I have n of those, and I take the outer product, sum them up. This gives me my my one RDM. Yes. Or no? Are we are we on the same page here, or 
Oh, you know, okay, that so my, my low level Hamilton. Okay, yeah? so you're constraining the eigenvalues but not the functions. I, I do not constrain that I take, I don't say this here. I say okay. equals some set i where the cardinality yeah. of i is equal n e. So I so, don't say So kind of zero one one valued eigenvalues. Absolutely, functions. yes, yes. Yes, yes. And if you pick, if you pick zero, zero or, or one to n e, then you get the Aufbau principle, right? This is the, this is the idea. But we allow um, different occupations, and this is the, okay. All right. Yes, so this, this is our alternative picture of how to match. How do we do this computationally? How do we find the minimum of this constraint optimization problem? And the idea here is to use an augmented Lagrangian. Okay, so if you haven't heard of the augmented Lagrangian, it's a very nice idea that resembles the Lagrangian uh, very closely. So here's how it reads. We have the objective function that is to be minimized, which is this trace. And then we have the Lagrange multiplier, which is uh, what we would have in the Euler-Lagrange approach. But what is new now compared to the Lagrangian is this penalty term. Yeah? So if you know the penalty method, this is exactly what you would get if you only use the penalty method. This is this quadratic um, penalization of dx uh, not equal to px. Right? So this has some cool advantages over the uh, Euler-Lagrange method as well as the penalty method. So the first thing is that introducing this penalty term actually transforms the stationary points from saddle points to minima. So this is really neat because saddle points are not um, that, that nice to characterize. The other thing is the Lagrange multipliers ensure that you have a first order optimality condition. This is something you do not have if you use only the penalty method. So this is an advantage over the uh, quadratic penalty method. The other thing is that we improve by introducing this Lagrangian term here is that we do not need to push alpha to infinity anymore. You can show that for some epsilon accuracy it's enough to have like a finite uh, alpha max after which you know that you're your um, stationary point of this guy here actually is in an absolute vicinity of the solution. Yes? Is something like a proximal gradient method that you propose? Uh, this is how we, so the proximal gradient is, I think, related to the optimization how we find the minimum of this. This will be on the next slide. Yeah. So I think the proximal gradient is related to the um, projected. Uh, yeah. Sorry? It's related to moral regularization. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so right. sure. I, 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 I think, I, I I think it's, it's right. It's yeah. I, your, your proximate gradient is on the next slide. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I was talking about this alpha max, and you may wonder what's the size. For all the numerical experiments that we did, alpha max was equal to 10. Okay, so you can make out of this whatever you want, but for the systems we looked at, 10 was sufficient. Yeah? All right. So, so can I ask a yes. theoretical question? So, so what about just keeping the second term? Why do you need the first term? Sorry? Why? So when you want to do matching, why do you need the, the red term? The red term? So if you, you drop, if you drop the red term, you have something that's called the quadratic penalty method. And the quadratic penalty method behaves, in principle, very different from the augmented Lagrangian. The first thing is your your minimum will not be an, a stationary point of your, um, of your objective function anymore. So this is the first thing. Whether or not this is important, uh, you, you can debate. But the other thing is that you have to push this alpha parameter in the penalty method to infinity to ensure the, um, that this condition is fulfilled. And this we don't have anymore. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, there are a few uh, oh, very nicely written chapters in the classical textbook like North Dow and White, right? So illustrating the difference between the penalty and the Lagrangian, like augmented Lagrangian uh, method. To show indeed you only need finite alpha, which is very, very important in America. Fabian, you obtain perfect matching. So yes. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Um, okay, so the last thing that I would like to point out is that for quote-unquote well-behaved systems, um, this 
methodologically, met methodological um, approach, this different approach, finds the same solution as we would with least squares DMET or something that's called CVX DMET, which is um, the idea of uh, Lin and Mike and Xiao Zhe Wu and co-authors, where they applied the Legendre Fenchel transformation to get a convex, yeah. Um, so, how do, we, how do we implement this augmented Lagrangian and how do we minimize it in practice? And this is where uh, Reinhold's uh, approximate, approximate gradient comes into play. So this is what we call the projected gradient. Uh, so this is really a very nice idea um, that came out, that, that, that Lin suggested, is that we optimize this Lagrangian um, alternatingly. So you fix the correlation potential, you minimize, you find the argument of the augmented Lagrangian with respect to D, then you update your Lagrange multipliers, feed them back in, and you do this until you reach convergence. Okay, and the problem 1a, this uh, arg min, is found by using the projected gradient method. So the incorporation of um, this augmented Lagrangian formulation into the, the SCF DMET procedure is what we call ALM DMET for augmented Lagrangian method hyphen DMET. Yes. Yeah, so it's uh, Uzawa? Is it, is it uh, the, Sorry? It's a gradient method on the dual problem? So it's like. The projected uh, gradient? Yeah. No, so, you do a, so what you do is you do a, um, a gradient step and yeah. then you project onto the set of admissible functions M. Okay. So yeah. it, is it compared to Uzawa? Is it two? Uzawa. Uzawa. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know this. Compared to? Uzawa. Uzawa algorithm. No? Hmm. No? Yeah. Uh, how does it work? I don't know. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a project. It's a projected gradient on, on the dual uh, problem. Mm. This is for the primal. You literally. But, uh, you you is a dual variable, right? Yes. You is the dual. Uh, if you do right. convex duality, it's uh, yeah. similar. So it's, it's like not. But you is fixed here, right? Yeah, yeah but ah. in the second yeah. step, it's exactly the same. But okay, well, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Probably this way. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure. Okay, okay, we can discuss. <laughs> um, yeah. Are there, are there other questions about the, the method part so far? Yes. We need a line search for alpha. Okay, so this is... Um, oh, no, not really. You fix it and you keep it and that's it. It's, it's a bit... It's even worse. So... <laughs> we... <laughs> we the way I know augmented Lagrangian is that you keep updating alpha and uh, Lagrangian. Yes, alpha that's bias. what we do. So we, we set an ad hoc number of steps after which we increase alpha. This, this seems to be working just fine. So in the beginning, the intuition is we walk quite freely through space. And after we are, hopefully, after X amount of steps, we're somewhere in the region where we can systematically penalize this harder and harder. This is the, and yes, yeah. but. Um, we try to be very honest with what our parameter settings are for the considered numerical problems. And we found a setting that allowed us to converge all these three problems um, uniformly, so uh, to converge them with the same settings of parameters. Of course, for the individual problems, it turned out that you can optimize alpha as well as the step. So here in this projected gradient, you also have a step length. This, this is what we adjust. So all these parameters for the individual numerical applications can be tweaked to reach optimality or to, to reach convergence significantly faster. Yeah. Yes? So when you project, you're projecting onto the space of projection, right? We project onto, onto the set of um, admissible functions, M. So, so you could have the generated eigenvalues, right? I mean, when you have the gap in the gapless problem. And then, so how do you choose? Do you, does it matter how you choose? Yeah, so may, maybe... Um, yeah, I can, I can try to lay out the, the procedure. Uh, let's see if that, if that works. So, um, so say that D, I don't know, is this readable from there at all? Okay. M, and then you have uh, L alpha D, then you have U, X, K, which are fixed at this point. Okay, and we say, um, 
we want to do a, a projected gradient. So what this does, it is an iterative um, procedure. So you have to start with some kind of initial guess. So we, have, we say now, because the dk plus 1 is the outcome yeah. of the minimization, so you have to say, you say dk, and then we have to introduce another iterative. Yeah? So this is... Uh, this is dk, and then what we say is we take, we take a um, gradient step. So this would be dk plus 1 l plus t d l alpha d k plus 1 l u x k. Yeah, it looks something like this. And then what we want is that the, the dk plus 1 l plus 1 is equal to the argmin of d taken in m w l minus d. Okay, so this is the projection step. And what we, what we do is we say that if w l is diagonalizable, Uh, Q, yeah, so if WL can be written in this particular form, then we know that, oops, DK plus 1, L plus 1 is equal to Q, T, and then here comes the projection. You have like this DX, Q, where the dx solve the following minimization. Uh, let's see. Um, D was a vector. And D, the individual entries are either 0 or 1, and you want that the sum is equal to Ne. The first line, that should be oh. minus t, right? Because there's a gradient. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So you we scoot the board just a little bit left so it gets cutting cut off by the podium. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> perfect, perfect. I don't know. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> so this down here just says that the individual dx are in 0, 1, and they sum up to any. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just a sketch, but this is roughly what, what goes on, right? You have to evaluate this, and, but really the projection, the projection is just picking, look at what, what are the eigenvalues of this W matrix, which ones are the largest, set those to one or the others are zero. And then you, you evaluate um, your, your next D by QT diag X Q. And, and if t is small enough, you you are okay because there, there will be an e uh, close to one and uh, the rest close to zero, right? If t is small enough, it is, if t is small enough, then you know that you will have uh, uh, an e eigenvalues close to one and the others close to zero. Yes. Uh, uh, maybe I'm not sure. Maybe just because it's a small enough step. Yeah. yeah. Oh. 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 Yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, any more more questions on? <laughs> okay. Yes. The minimization would be in M. Is that the same as an SVD? Is that the same as an SVD? Not SVD. It's just G, just gradient descent and project to the admissible set. No, no, right. But you're minimizing the Frobenius norm. Mm -hmm. W L minus B with the upper. Yeah, right end projection. Here, this you take the minimum, so this is basically. Yeah, on the right end projection. So isn't that an SVD? Yeah, but Carlos, you're right, it's a choice, but I mean, the way the angles come up, if he has two last ones, he picks one of them and sets it one. Yeah, it's kind of choice. Sorry? Basically, some rounding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of stuff we can discuss maybe af afterwards. Um, yeah, so le yeah, le let me tell you one, one last thing that will pop up in the numerical examples, and this is the 
um, the occupation profile. You know, this is some kind of post-processing. It's absolutely not necessary for the success of DMET, of ALM DMET. We don't need this. But we do this to check which orbitals are actually occupied and which ones are not occupied. So how does this work? It is that at convergence of ALM DMET, that means the matching condition is fulfilled and all the Euler-Lagrange multipliers are converged, then your Lagrange multiplier U actually takes the role of a correlation potential. So in this particular case, once the ALM procedure is converged, you can write down your low-level Hamiltonian, which is equal to F plus U, and you can diagonalize it and compute the orbitals. Having the orbitals at hand, you can identify um, those orbitals that I here denote by this set I, which are used to, 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 generate, <laughs> to generate your one RDM. You just take the product of D with phi M, since these are orthonormal to each other, you will find those that actually are within the contribution um, for D to have a value one, and all the others are zero. Okay, so this will be, this is how we compute the occupation profile. Okay, let's, let's move on to the numerical results and leave the theory part um, behind. So I have three, um, three examples that I would like to show. Um, the first one is a 2D Hubbard model with periodic boundary conditions. We have six by six sites, and the impurities are of size two by two. For those who have not seen the Hubbard model, Yet. It's like a very simple Hamiltonian. It only has nearest neighbor a hopping term. And then we have an on-site interaction that is steered by the uh, quantity U. And we are going to look at two cases. First one is half-filling, and the other one is called hole-doped. Yeah? So we remove four electrons out of the half-filling case. So note that U is equal to 8, so we are in a sort of strong correlation regi regime. Yeah? Okay. So first, the half-filling case. So the half-filling case is assumed to be easy for DMET. And a gut feeling explanation is that your impurity systems resemble the global system uh, much more in the half-filling case. And the reason is that Lynn has nicely pointed out that the, the high-level systems are always at half-filling. So now you have that even your global system is at half-filling. So it, it, it looks like there's much more resemblance. Now it's just a gut feeling explanation. And in these cases, all the DMET methods work. So here's ALM. This is our new method. Here's the least squares fit. And here's the CVX fit. So the CVX fit, again, is where you rewrite the matching condition using the legendre fenchel transformation. And you see that not only the converged energies are the same, but actually every iteration is the same. So the, the algorithms, all three versions of them, do pretty much the same thing, or yield the same SCF trajectory. Okay, uh, Identical energy, energies, and if you were to check the occupation profile for ALM, it's very um, unspectacular. It's just following the off-focus. Checkerboard, right? Hmm? Okay, in local orbitals, should be a checkerboard? I think you get a checkerboard structure, but Arch, really here what we are looking for is off-bow or non-off-bow. Yeah. And they all follow the, the off-bow principle. <clears throat> okay, now the, the more interesting case, yeah, hole doping. You remove four electrons, and the situation changes dramatically. First of all, your problem becomes gapless. So the gap is, I, I don't recall the, the numerical value, but it's certainly lower than 10 to the negative 5. So it's very, very dangerous. CVX DMET does not converge at all. So it becomes a random number generator. Um, LS DMET, for some reason, um, is in the right energy regime, but... You have to know that the matching error is significant. So we have 10 to the negative 1 to 10 to the negative 2 error in the matching procedure. So whether or not you can trust these calculations is debatable to say the least. The other thing is that your least squares procedure does not converge either. It, it wobbles around in the right region, but even after 30 iterations, you don't have a, an energy convergence. Now, it doesn't reach our 10 to the negative 6 uh, convergence threshold. The ALM, on the other hand, yields pretty much exact fit. So the matching error is of order 10 to the negative 7. And it shows like a very typical DMT calculation. We, we somewhat systematically converge towards a value within 12 iterations. 
done. So what, what happened here? We can look at the, the Aufbau print, at, at the occupation profile. So here I have, we've plotted the orbitals over the iterations. And the yellow, the yellow squares, they correspond to um, occupation value equal one, and the purple ones are occupation value equal zero. And you see that even starting from iteration one, ALM DMET suggests to violate the Aufbau principle in order to fit the high level density matrices. And this cannot be remedied throughout these SCF iterations. So it gets a little better, it, it moves up a bit, but it does not get remedied. So what this means is up for debate. But as Lynn said, this is what the solver suggests we should do. Yes? Can you remind me if this happens in all the, you know, like you see those different dimensions as well, the Hubbard here? In different directions? Right, uh, dimensions, right? Oh. So you're doing a 2D Hubbard. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea how this depends on dimension, this non Aufbau behavior? Ooh, we haven't, we okay. haven't checked. But so the next example is a hydrogen chain, Perfect. which somewhat resembles okay, Hubbard. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay with so, that. So um, <laughs> there, there you will see what, what goes wrong there. But um, I, I don't recall the experiments for the 1D Hubbard, unfortunately. Kind of a weird question. Yeah. No, no. Do you, yes. I have a question on your question. Do you expect to, to, to change with the dimension? Uh, sometimes you'll find that there are numerical issues that change with dimension, but here I'm not sure. I, I'm just I'm thinking about so my, in like molecular systems. My, yeah. so. my, my guess would be it depends on, on you. So if you, right. if you increase u high enough, you will probably see something similar in the 1D Hubbard. Some of that u dependence depends on the dimension sometimes. Yes. So. Yeah, so if, if, we, if we lower u far enough, this disappears, and also the gapless problem somehow um, disappears. Okay. Yes? Can I ask, how, how do you uh, handle the SU2 gauge and global gauge invariants? Do you, do you fix on one side the direction or something? Uh, I, I, I don't really follow the question, I have to admit. So. I mean, you can, you can sort of say, turn all the spins uh, mm -hmm. simultaneously on every side and it will not change the energy. And, and this should cause some instability, I would imagine, unless you fix the configuration at one side to be, say, pointing up in that direction. This is a very good question. So it's half, it's half filling. No, no, this yeah, is that has nothing to do yeah. with that. So, so the answer is that this is an unrestricted version of the DMET, which is like UHF. It prefers a spin sim uh, symmetry breaking solution. As long as you break the symmetry initially a little bit, it will just yeah, break by itself. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. If you do the uh, completely uh, GHF uh, like a version, uh, the, the issue mm -hmm. set will. Yeah. Thanks. So, so you, uh, you randomly initialize this? Hmm? You randomly initialize the. No. We start, I think we have. Initialize it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, otherwise, it will be even worse. Yeah, thank you for the question and the comment. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, so this, this is everything that we, that we got out of the Hubbard model, because we knew the 2D Hubbard model has this kind of gapless problem, and using ALM, it seemed that we could circumvent this to a certain extent. The next problem, the next problem where we see um, the gapless issue arising is the hydrogen chain. So we have 36 hydrogen atoms in a linear configuration. And for this system, what happens is that if you check different fragment sizes, so 36 is a very favorable number, so you can have fragment sizes 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, 12, 18. So you can test all of these and see how your algorithm performs. And one thing is that intuitively, you would expect that as you increase your fragment size, you systematically converge to the accuracy of the high level solver because your fragment becomes larger and larger and larger until eventually it contains the full system and then you just have your, your, your high level solver giving you the answer. What has been um, reported so far is that as you systematically incre increase the fragment size, you suppress your gap. So the problem eventually becomes gapless as you increase the fragment size. So you were actually not um, able to test this limit um, before. So here's how this looks. So we have a CVX DMET. 
and we increase the fragment size, and we plot the, um, the gap here in a log lin plot. And you see that for one, two, three, uh, it's, it's somewhat uh, reasonable, but then it, it tanks, like, dramatically. And for fragment size equals six, it is actually so small that CVX, again, fails to converge. So we get, like, all kinds of numbers here, and we do not report fragment size six from CVX, therefore. On the other hand, you see ALM DMET follows a very similar trajectory in the beginning, but then it just keeps converging as we increase the fragment size, and it shows the expected trend that as we increase the fragment size even further, we eventually reach the limit of our high accuracy solver. So this is as expected, and we can, we can prove this now with ALM DMET. Now what happens to the occupation profile? You see that, so here, Again, I plot the orbitals as uh, a function of the fragment size. And on the left panel here, you see the, um, the occupation profile after the first SCF iteration. And on the right, you see the occupation profile at convergence. Um, oh, I'm, I'm running out of time, I think. Uh, yeah, so what you see here is that for fragment size equals six, where CVX starts to fail, uh, the solver actually su suggests to um, break the off ball principle. You see that during the SCF procedure, this can be remedied, and we find for fragment size equals six that there exists a solution that follows the off ball principle. However, this cannot be reached with, uh, C with CVX or least squares DMET because the SCF trajectory requires you to leave the allowed realm at some point in this trajectory. And it gets even worse that if you go up to 12 and 18 in uh, fragment size, this cannot be remedied anymore. Again, the interpretation, the physical interpretation of this is um, unclear at this point. Okay, let me talk about the last um, system that we look at. So we've seen the 2D Hubbard hydrogen chain. Now it's even simply, we only have six hydrogens and we open them up. We have like a square geometry and we make them to a linear geometry. And this is somewhat inspired by the H4 model introduced by Jankowski and Paldus where you have four hydrogens and you open up the geometry. And the idea is that during this opening procedure you go through different stages of electronic correlation. And our hope was to maybe see that the vanishing low level gap is somewhat physical because you go through different um, phases and you might see some something. But for us, this seems like it's really, it, it, it doesn't mean anything if your gap vanishes. So what we look at here is the Homo-Lumo gap, and we compute also the fundamental gap at the level of um, full CI. And where, the, where your hydrogens are more in a linear geometry, you, your system is in a somewhat a dynamically correlated phase. So you would not expect your, your gap to close there, because a closing gap is commonly related to a metallic system, but again, please correct me if, I, if, if I'm wrong here, but we see that actually as this is a linear, in the linear geometry, the gap closes in both cases, LS and CVX. So this is why we believe there's no physical meaning behind this closing gap, at least at this point in time. Yes? What were your fragments for this one? Uh, one atom. Okay, let's talk again about the energies. Yeah, so here for scale, we have the RHF and the MP2 energies. Uh, the important one is the black line here, which is full CI. On top of it, you may see this dashed red line, which is the CCSD solution, which is really good for this um, system. And then we have our different DMET methods. Again, CVX DMET eventually fails because recall that uh, CVX reports a vanishing gap for the angle 0 0.5 and larger. So we do not report the values beyond this point. LSDMET eventually also reports a vanishing low level gap. So the fit actually gets terrible. And we do not know if we can trust the results anymore. Knowing the benchmark, of course, we see that it is somewhat acceptable. But if you only had your least squares DMET results, this would be um, a very big point of concern. The ALM DMET, on the other hand, um, yields the same result as CVX and least squares DMET in the region where the gap is uh, significantly large. 
then it somewhat follows the trajectory of uh, LSTMET, but then it goes down and yields better energies. And the fit is always given up to accuracy of 10 to the negative 7. So let's look at the Aufbau principle. We see again the first iteration in the SCF procedure, uh, the orbitals as a function over the angle. You see where CVX reports a vanishing low-level gap. The solver suggests to break um, the Aufbau principle. Some of these, in some of these points during the SCF procedure, again, this can be remedied, but not in all of them. Same picture pretty much as before. Now, I want to say one last thing before concluding. So, if you've looked closely here, you saw that the energy went down, but it actually went down a bit too aggressively. So, what you can do, and what we did, we looked at this region and moved these two points closer and closer together. And we actually saw that if we changed if we got to the point where we only had to change the angle by uh, 10 to the negative 3 or 10 to the negative 4, the energy still showed the jump. This means that ALM yields a discontinuous potential energy surface. And that is very concerning. So this raises basically the question whether or not an only integer filling in the DMET context is uh, physical or not. Okay, and this is what... Um, the last part of the talk the, to which I want to go through very, very quickly are these unanswered problems. So what happened was here that um, collaborators, Garnet Chan and uh, his um, PhD student, uh, Jihao Chu, they came up with a, a minimal working example, looking at sort of the fitability of uh, density matrices. And the idea is if you have a two by two density matrix, you can completely control it with two parameters only. One is the eigenvalue n, because that fixes the other one to be 1 minus n. And then you can unitarily rotate around one angle alpha. This gives you all possible 2 by 2 uh, um, density matrices. So there's a bit more going on in this minimal working example. But the key message is that we find when going through these different configurations of the minimal working example of the density matrix, we find regions where we get a fantastic fit quality. But then we have these boat-shaped regions where we do not achieve fit following the Aufbau principle. Uh, so these are, these are hard, hard boundaries to regions where we cannot fit anymore. And if you look at the corresponding gap, you see it is well gapped in the region where we can fit. And where we cannot fit, the gap actually vanishes. Uh, so this really shows the, the connection between the vanishing low-level gap and the violation of the Aufbau principle. And this raised the conjecture, after certain um, discussions, whether or not the non-V-representable 1RDMs can actually be uh, ensemble representable. This seems the most general way to represent, to fit a density matrix. And yeah, is there a question? Oh, I don't, so I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> No, I was just wondering because we know you want to fit the exact sum, say exact Poisson sum. And so you know that this part could be uh, ensemble representable. Yeah. So where is the problem? That was what I was so the about. problem is that um, I've not told you the entire truth about DMET. And that is the. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a catch, and that is in the bath construction. So if you allow for fractional um, one RDMs that are supposed to give you more information on your, um, on your correlation between the fragment and the bath, you have to come up with a better way of, bath const of the bath construction. And this is what we are currently exploring. And I will show one more result with you, and then I'm, I'm done. Yeah, so um, the, oh, actually two more slides, but yeah. So, the, uh, the fractional occupancy can be built into this constraint optimization problem that I showed you in the beginning. You just drop the idempotency condition. And then this can be nicely formulated as a convex optimization problem. And you can implement this and come up with a number of bath orbital constructions. And here we have plotted two. So this is a plot um, done by a grad student in this group, Ray, uh, Ray Kim. And for these two bath constructions and the fractional fit, 
you actually see that your DMET, your fractional DMET, yields two different solutions. So this is again the whole doped Hubbard. Here we have our DMRG benchmark, which is extrapolated. So you see this gray shaded area is the extrapolation error. And I mean, this, this curve just looks really crazy to begin with. I mean, it looks like it's converging to something, but if you just keep running the DMET, and don't stop here because the, the um, energy convergence criterion is actually not fulfilled. You see that at some point it goes up and runs into this trusted region of the DMRG. So this is really, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is really wild what's going on here. And then if you look at the other bath construction, this actually shows a very typical DMET calculation. It's eight iterations. Every step in this SCF iteration works, the chemical potential, Fitting doesn't complain, the high level solvers don't complain, the fitting is excellent, it's higher accuracy than 10 to the negative 12, yet it shows another energy. So the question is what's going on? And um, I present this because the SCF trajectory here is really so DMET um, classic that, that we cannot say this is, this is a bug. So what we believe is that by relaxing the, um, the idempotency condition, you open up the possibility for DMET to approximate a different set of solutions. And the physicality of these have to be discussed. Maybe we have to impose some other physical constraint that would just lift this entire thing up, and we find that it works just fine, but this is, this is the frontier, this is where we are currently at. And therewith, I would, I would like Don't to... Don't rule out that the MRG has some problem. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, no, yes. the, the, the no, DMRG... Right. Yes, yeah, it might be, it might be that... Um, the DMRG is stuck in a local minimum, right? I mean, yeah. It can happen. Can happen, yeah. Unlikely, but, but it could happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. So let me, let me conclude, and then we can grab some coffee. So... What I've showed is that the gapless problem appears very frequently. So we've seen like very, very simple systems in which we found this problem and it's a problem that has to be taken seriously. Um, I've presented to you the ALM DMET, which is our way of circumventing the gapless problem and to remedy this to a certain extent. The fix of ALM DMET actually comes at a price, so we have to violate the Aufbau principle whether or not this is physical or the physical interpretation of this is still up for discussion. The more severe issue of ALM DMET at this point of time is that it may yield discontinuous potential energy surfaces. The remedy to this that we suggest or that we think um, is key here is the ensemble representability of the 1RDM. Um, we've seen that this yields a potentially larger set of solutions, whether or not this is the true one or not. It's also unclear at this point of time. And the other issue is that we have to adjust our bath construction. And then let me thank all the, the collaborators of this project. So Ray, who's a PhD student um, in Lin's group, and Ji Hao, who was a PhD student of Garnet, Zai Wen, Wen, and of course, Lin Lin. And also the, um, the funding agencies who were so nice to fund our research. And also thank you for your attention.